The full documentary, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV, has finally aired. And it's really quite shocking. I think that if you guys are even marginally aware of Dan Schneider and Amanda Bynes and what became a lot of a lot of these child stars, you definitely should give it a watch. Um, there was a lot in there that I wasn't aware of, even though I've researched this stuff before. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting. And Drake Bell finally did speak out uh, and reveal that he, in fact, was the victim of Brian Peck, a dialogue coach at Nickelodeon. And he went into detail about what happened to him and, and how and when and how it changed the trajectory of his career. And, you know, it's it's sort of hard to watch because this documentary kind of tries to end on a triumphant note. Mm -hmm. But really, it falls flat because you know that the entertainment industry has not fundamentally changed. Since, That's the hardest part. Since this generation of child stars grew up, it's still like this. And there is still a Dan Schneider out there or many of them or many Brian Pecks out there in the Hollywood sphere. And they're not going to get caught or if they will, they'll be replaced just as soon with other predators. And that's just the unfortunate reality. And they tried to end it on, you know, giving out like s possible solutions and like let's brainstorm on how to like fix this problem of child stars getting exploited. And I just feel like maybe it's not as simple as that, you know? It's not anywhere near as simple as that. It's, you can't just invite therapists and social workers and hr representatives onto a hollywood set and just magically fix all of these problems phil used to make a good point when he would talk about like abuse in the catholic church and he would say it's not a catholic thing what it is is that predators will look for places yes, with access yeah. to children right mm -hmm. and as long as there are shows that are going to have children in them there will be predators who will look to take advantage also of like the entertainment industry is where you're going to find the most toxic parents yep. which makes it even easier so that's why this i think has a specific issue rita in the chat even mentions brian singer well uh peck is connected to brian singer he had cameos in multiple x-men movies and did commentary on x-men movies with brian singer brian singer who is notorious for being uh allegedly accused of these things so i don't think he's ever been uh, it's ever been proven in, in like a court of law, but he is long. He hasn't worked in quite a few years, I think since 2019. Uh, and he's, it's kind of an open secret in that industry that he's viewed that way. My, my issue is that there's some things that are unavoidable, but some things that for me, at least they're commonsensical. Like it, for, it makes sense that men, you know, they were not as into child rearing as women are, or at least we, we don't have the instinct, you know, I, from my anecdotal experience to like enjoy like the company of children as much as women so when there's like very men that volunteer to be long and hard hours with very little pay around children it's like highly suspicious yeah. like I, I i don't know how that's not the first like hmm so this this documentary yeah. is is broken up into several pieces yeah right? i so want to like parts let's go through and kind of Give everyone a description of what each part entails. Yeah, so first, the uh, episode one and two aired together, and that basically covered the way that Dan Schneider got his start, how he was hired at Nickelodeon, and he was the creator of all that, which was basically SNL made for an audience of kids mm -hmm. with a cast of all kids. And um, they talked about the initial favorite of Dan Schneider, a girl named Katrina Johnson. And she was essentially the precursor to Amanda Bynes. And I think that, you know, the red flags were there when it came to Dan Schneider and his toxicity. They were definitely there, but I think he wasn't as powerful at that time. And they still had a director who was a middleman. His name was Virgil Fabian, and he eventually down the line was fired, but, um, Dan Schneider wasn't fully, you know, joker mode. He wasn't fully like b drunk with power by that, that period of time. But, you know, you still saw a bunch of examples of weird sexual innuendo jokes yep. that were in all that. And it was just very common. Um, they talked about Dan Schneider's misconduct in the writer's room. A couple of staff writers were interviewed for this one and they said that he would play pornography on his computer in the workplace and he would constantly make sexual jokes and write sexual jokes for children to perform. I think it's pretty clear that 
Dan Schneider was and is um, possibly still just a very psychologically depra depraved person, very perverted, and his porn addiction influenced everything that he wrote and everything that he talked about. There's a $20 super chat here from Pat the Plumber. says, PCC to round out the day with D-A-N-E-F-O-N-T to boot. Let's go. To boot. <laughs> to boot. Smell it up. Glad you know, I, I don't know if I saw this in the documentary or if I saw it on Twix, but there was like a reel and it was from Mariana Grande and it was That's Ariana Grande for those English speakers yeah. out there <laughs> and it was her <laughs> scenes like without the laugh track yeah and it was so jarring it was so jarring yeah I remember the, there was this one was like oh I wonder if you could squeeze juice out of a, a potato milking a potato and it was it, it was just like so on the nose really I'm like what's going no, that on that was like way later but this is bit. like this is the beginning of a pattern of behavior that all led up to that. And it yeah. was like over a decade where like, I wonder people if I could just... drink water upside down. And they, I mean, it, I'm telling you like the imagery is so like how she can... starts like literally sucking her own toes for yeah. kids content. I mean, it's just really obviously intentional that it's a sexual innuendo and yeah. maybe let's, Dan Schneider will deny that. But let's anyway, go back to the, the beginning. So these female writers, they are definitely adding some of their own stories that I think don't need to be there. It's kind of unnecessary, but it paints a bigger picture. Like, yes, we get like Dan Schneider is kind of a sociopath. Like he treats people badly. One of the staff writers said that um, she they were writing a, a scene that involved high schoolers. So she started telling this story about her in high school and she finished speaking and Dan Schneider responded oh you know what would be really funny if you bent over the table and pretended to get sodomized and like well you and you told the story over again well while you're pretending to get sodomized and then she's like no and then he keeps pushing it and pushing it and she literally did it she literally admitted that she did that and there were just other i mean it it almost like i'm sorry but it makes me laugh because it's like this is a grown person I don't really have a huge problem with the fact that Dan Schneider was kind of a jerk to adults. I have a problem with the way he treated kids who yeah. can't stand up for themselves. It's something they talked about in the documentary a lot that was like, whenever they had like real big and harsh news, they'd be like parents out of the room right now. Mm -hmm. And they would give the news to the kids. Mm -hmm. And like n naturally like years later, they would have their, their wherewithal would be like, oh wow, that was inappropriate or whatever. Like why wasn't my parents involved? But it's like, I don't know. It, they're your, just so your devious. your parent should have said like if you're asking me to leave the room like i'm not leaving the room True, you know? but yeah but it's what you said like the worst parents they are the they and they said you know obviously we due to child labor laws these kids have to you know do school hours and they have limited work hours their parent or guardian has to be on set with them in either eye shot or ear shot at all times which you know definitely is a rule that was broken a lot and these kids were not treated well. Dan Schneider was a jerk to them, and that's the least of uh, all of the rest of the allegations they get into. So general workplace toxicity is less egregious than everything else this documentary covers. And that leads up to basically Jason Handy. There's the first arrest. Yes. Yeah. This is April 2003. So Jason Handy, and yes, that's his real name. name. Uh -huh. That's his real <laughs> name. This is nominal determinism. I'm telling you, like this is like physiognomy, but for names. You should know yeah. that this guy's a red flag. So Jason Handy is a production assistant, and he got arrested because someone uh, we don't know who it was tipped off law enforcement that he was creeping on the kids and. Basically, police raided his apartment and found over 10,000 images of CP um, in mm. his apartment. And not only that, but he had Ziploc bags that had different young girls' names on them. Mm. He had, like, for instance, the underwear of a seven-year-old girl. He, he kept letters from one of the girls on the cast named Brandy. Um, he would go to church with him or the he he was invited into this girl's home yeah. one of the one of the guest stars and molested this girl I mean it's just insane what you think these parents are doing with their kids and and they're not protecting their kids but yeah. I mean he even had a journal where he was just saying like very explicitly you know I'm a pedophile I'm going to assault one of these children on cast like he he was very obviously a bad person. No. So he got arrested. 
it's hard to dance to this. <laughs> it's Sorry. having this conversation. Thank you, guys. Um, so he got arrested, and then... No dancing. You know, they told the kids, and then it was just like, all right, business as usual, get back to work. And then they start to set up the, the picture for, you know, Amanda Bynes as the next rising star in all that. And Dan Schneider discovered her and just, you know, wanted to get his grubby little hands all over her because she's a product. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, fast forward, she gets her own show. She gets the Amanda show and she's starting to grow up and she just has this really weirdly close relationship with Dan Schneider and like just kind of physically too close and emotionally too close. And too much time alone behind too much time closed alone. doors without parents or anyone there to know and corroborate exactly what it said. One of the ways in which this documentary kind of fails is that the stuff, there are no firsthand accounts from Amanda Bynes or from certain other cast members which would have really driven home the point and you get these secondhand accounts which are powerful but not as powerful as if they were able to get f you know straight from the horse's mouth per se you know you got drake bells right but, you know the the stuff about amanda P Bynes is all implied because there isn't any you know evidence or proof of what happened behind those uh, those doors but what they're really good at is showing you the stuff that's kind of in plain sight yes because with her in particular i remember they show this one scene where she's in a she's in a bathing suit in a hot tub and he's like fully clothed in a hot tub uh, yeah. Because like he's fine. Not gross. just that, but the the, the massages. I know, but like, but th that one was particularly on the nose because she 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 basically says so I'm in a hot tub with the executive producer or whatever his title is. So do I get a raise? And it's like well, it, it's a joke, but it's yeah. like, like you're they, you're like, saying it. They find multiple quotes from Dan Schneider over the years where he's like, I have a frightening amount of influence over these children. He said like I can put them in whatever nightmare situations I want to, and he's joking but he's not actually joking you know yeah. um so yeah she just has this weirdly close relationship with him that continues on and on and then as she gets older um and she's starting to be seen in more of an adult light and her career is changing he wants to follow her and she eventually makes a petition for emancipation from her parents because she's having relationship problems with her parents and she goes to dan for help uh, as well as other legal representatives in her team, because Dan is part of her team. Um, it's unclear how that went down, but it's weird to say this 16-year-old girl ran away from home and called this guy first. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. like a second father to her. It's weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think I don't think that the documentary fails in that they don't have first-hand accounts, though, because they obviously, with the scope of what they're doing, mm -hmm. They obviously asked all of these people for interviews yeah. and the majority of them said no. They probably asked every last cast member for interviews. Amanda Bynes probably said no. Miranda Cosgrove probably said no. Josh Peck probably said no. Victoria Justice, Ariana Grande, all of these people. They're all of the most powerful ones, actually. They're all saying no to interviews. And they're, I mean, because Amanda Bynes, she did, probably doesn't even want to remember anything. So yeah. why would she do an interview? It's just really sad what's become of her. But anyway, episodes three and four, it kind of ends on this cliffhanger, and then they go into Drake Bell and Brian Peck. So Drake Bell was on all that. Uh, Brian Peck was a dialogue coach, an acting coach for the cast members, and he is definitely seen as a red flag by Drake Bell's dad. Drake Bell's dad is his manager, and he is extremely protective. Unlike a lot of these parents, Drake mm -hmm. Bell's dad was just... A golden yeah. example of how to protect your kids. So much of what you saw in these documentaries was the failure of the adults around these children to really, really protect their own yeah. children. And his dad was, yes, the perfect example of somebody who did everything right and still ended up um, being driven a wedge between him and his child because of the awful behavior of this pedophile who wanted to get between him and his child because he wanted access to him. We you got, got a $20. $20 from Ignat and Air. I don't know if I said that right. Earthlings will send their children to get exploited Earth for a things. fleeting chance at fame. We laugh at you from our child molestation free utopia that is the moon. We have advanced far beyond your third dimensional television. <laughs> um, Must be better over there. Sounds, sounds like nice. Um, somebody sounds in the nice. chat, somebody asked if Josh Peck is related to Brian Peck. They are not related. No, just, just total coincidence that they have the same last name, but I thought the same thing too. Um, but yeah, so 
basically Brian Peck was trying to get closer and closer to Drake, but Drake's dad was always like, no, like stay away. 20 Justin one said the sexual jokes didn't bother me as much in this doc compared to the PDF file stuff. Early 2000s kids cartoons like SpongeBob have a ton of sexual innuendos and some of the best jokes on that show that are adult jokes. Okay. I think it's the physical nature of the jokes. Like in a lot of ways, right? It's, it's putting the kids in that position mm -hmm. as opposed to just telling a joke from a cartoon perspective. Does that make sense? A kid Definitely will, more. Yes. There's a difference there. I think. Yeah, I, I agree because but I do it like on a hierarchy of problems. The actual PDF file stuff is yeah. far, far scarier. But just saying that it True. shows you what the culture was there because it's also part of like humiliating them because it's like, oh, they're unaware right now that they're being objectified right, sexually. Right. It, it's I don't know. It's like That's some sick satisfaction from it. it. I think it's like a humiliation ritual, yeah. basically. And it's the fact that the kids are innocent and don't know what it is it's that disturbing. makes it funnier to adults. And I, I find that disgusting. So um, over time, Drake says that Brian Peck basically poisoned him against his own dad. And Drake Bell eventually was convinced to fire his dad as his manager, start living with his mom. And his mom is... This is Check the most out. infuriating part of the documentary. Drake Bell's dad warned his mom about yeah. Brian Peck. Yeah. He said, this guy is a red flag. Do not let Drake be alone with Brian Peck. Mom and care. mom didn't listen. When we were watching this, I was just, I was so angry at this. Yeah. So the dad, the dad went on, like was willing to go on record on this documentary, talk about all that he did to try and protect his son only to be essentially removed from his own son's life and yeah. basically given his own son to a predator because he had no way of protecting him. Yeah. And, and the mom, you can like, see the, like the worst part was like the mom's like, di didn't want to drive to LA. So I'm going to let this guy who my ex-husband specifically warned against do it for me. It, it, it's, and it feels, I mean, obviously I don't know the couple, but it just feels like, it was her getting a one up on him. It was like, I'm going to do the opposite of what you asked for. Like, look at the cost, man. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good point. It does seem like vindictive in a sense. But, I mean, who's to say? Because Drake Bell's mom didn't get interviewed. You just see that I mean, <laughs> Drake's dad is just in so much pain just talking about it. And you can see, like, he's one of the good parents, one even, of very, very few. Even when Peck was caught, Drake wouldn't tell him that it was him that was the one being abused initially he, yeah. initially yeah it, it, uh, well, what's also incredible it's the, the talking length about how these people go and set up these situations and uh, so much of it is like complete isolation uh, from them from other people except the the person in question that wants to do these uh, devious stuff like he, he wanted them to like crash on his couch and at one point he said like I need you to convince Dan Schneider for me to be your dad on Drake, on and, Drake Josh. and Josh. Yeah. I mean, I, that's like so many levels. So like not only, right. so he wants to keep an eye on him at work, outside of work. I saw somebody, and, and to your point, I saw somebody in the chat say like, it's always the moms. Well, the one of the few moms that was looking out for Drake was his girlfriend's mother yeah. who noticed that uh, Peck was calling him 430 times at his girlfriend's house. And she's like, that's not normal. She had to pull Drake aside and say, what's going on? And then she had to be the one to try and talk to his family about it because his mom wasn't looking out for him. Yeah, because Brian Peck was essentially just harassing Drake Bell at this point. Yeah. And he, you know, he eventually comes out with the truth to his mom. They go to the police. They get a full confession from Brian Peck over the phone, and he's just like, you just basically told everyone <laughs> what you did. So yeah. then um, this goes to trial, and the most, I think, like, second most infuriating thing that you learn about this story is that Brian Peck gets support from about 50 people on his side of the courtroom the day of the verdict. 50 people, and for Drake Bell, it was just his mom and his brother on his side yeah. of the courtroom. And... Then he gets 41 character recommendation letters sent to the judge by his friends and acquaintances in the industry. Yep. And that includes celebrities. So I wanted to go to that list of people that, that gave him character letters. It includes stars. Um, so here are, they, here they are. 
what uh, only some of the 41 people who did it james marsden uh, he's, Taren, uh, he's in sonic yeah the hedgehog movies yeah he's james just, marsden Taryn killam Alan Thicke, Thomas DeSanto, Ron Melendez, Ryder Strong, Will Friedel. Both of Boy Meets World. Joanna Kearns, Kimmy Robertson, Rich Carell, and Beth Carell. And there were obviously many more. But they were all writing these character letters in the most insidious language, saying no. that this is out of Brian Peck's character. And I can only imagine that he was put under duress and he was tempted to do what he did. Also, but beyond that, it was fair to point out, like there was a point where Drake's dad points out this behavior to the people on set and they said, well, he's gay. You must just be bigoted. Yeah, I mean, dude, that I'm was, telling you, it's the tactics. Yeah. Like, the, it's the oldest playbook in the world. Yeah. So, I mean, they basically, just... They gaslit him and said, it's not that your son's in danger. It's that you're, a hom that you're homophobic. Just think of modernity. Like, how much of it, this is like, no, no, we'll take care of it. You, need, you remove yourself from the process entirely. I mean... This is, yeah, like, you should have been seen as a warning sign for what was to come in oh, hollywood birth but control. birth control take your birth control um ultimately though uh brian peck got 16 months in prison and then went right back to work at disney. right back dude and then disney hired him for sweet life of zach and cody immediately after this is uh, as much as i complain about the internet one of the things the internet has going for it is that the information travels quicker now and in some cases that can be a bad thing because misinformation passes really fast but it can also be a good thing because accurate information will also pass faster and nowadays, you know, the hope would be that in the age of the internet and social media, Dr uh, Drake Bell points out, he goes, there was no Twitter or TMZ following you to and from the courtroom every right. day. Well, that's good for the, the victim who doesn't want to be bothered on the way to the courtroom, who's going through something traumatic enough. But it's also good for the criminal who then doesn't have to worry about the scrutiny that would later come when the internet came around. Came There's about. two things I deduce from this. Mm -hmm. It's like, number one, it, it really seems like Hollywood is a sick cult that protects their own, mm -hmm. like to the, the detriment of, I don't know, everyone. And the second thing is like, there's just a statistic that everyone likes to tout and is that, you know, homes without fathers tend to have more of these things happen. And then it was Drake's father that could discern the kind of the energy from these the, this individual mm -hmm. and man that that's why i am in my personal life when whenever i have a female friend that asks me to like a, a recommendation of like hey like i'm single and i want to date someone i always tell them have your brothers or your father like discern mm -hmm. like have the closest man to you should judge the, their character because I, I don't know what it is about us like we we sniff it out of each other yeah and and i don't know well it depends because then you can see that amanda Bynes's father was clearly very in cahoots with dan schneider and well that's why i mean the closest like the you know it's just a lot of these parents are just yeah, totally right. toxic and selfish and imagine the pressure of being a kid who's responsible for your family's income. I mean, I know it's the law that you have to have a parent or guardian on set at all times, mm -hmm. but that means that that parent or guardian can't have a job. So that means that They're dependent even on though your parent is theoretically there to protect you, um, they are still dependent on you staying there. So they also can't protect you. And you he, can't protect yourself and your parent can't protect you. I think the what happened with Drake is a is a perfect microcosm again of this whole situation, which is that they can put all the safeguards up that they want. They can institute all of the rules, all of the policies. A motivated predator will find a way around it if given mm -hmm. the opportunity. And the number one stopgap that you can put between you and a predator is a parent who cares, pays attention, and unfortunately has to be willing to walk away yeah. for the safety of their child. Yeah. And far too often, that's just simply not the case. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye, guys.